take your Bible, turn to Matthew 25 if you would, and I hope you brought a Bible. If not, there's one in the pew. If not, I'll put it up on the screen, but I want you to read your Bible. We are talking about Jesus and who Jesus is, and I'm glad that I know Jesus. I'm glad that I know him, and this is, um, again, we're just studying the basic doctrines, what it is. You'd be amazed when you go to, to study what you believe, it's simple, but there's so much in the Bible concerning you just pick a subject. Like God, we talked about God, we talk, we're talking about Jesus. And to try to limit your discussion on any one of those, um, to narrow it down to just a few teachings, to me is impossible because there's so much, and I'll say it this way, concerning Jesus or just the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus permeates, in my opinion, every word in your Bible. There's nothing in this book that is, make sure I say this right. There's nothing in here that's not about Jesus in some way or form. He is, he is the central figure of the Bible. And again, to those who try to separate the Bible from who Jesus is, it's a, it's a grave mistake and it will result in you worshiping the wrong Jesus. In fact, Jesus is so important to the theme of the Bible, to uh, salvation, to eternal life, to the plan, everything that God has done, is doing now, and will do, focuses on Jesus. In fact, Hebrews 10 tells us what Jesus said before he came to earth 2,000 years ago. What Jesus said was, the whole Bible is my instructions for what I'm to do in this world. He said, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And so everything about this Bible, I think, has something to do in some fashion or another with the person of Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about Jesus and the various forms that he takes in the scriptures, the various roles that he takes. And uh, we've been talking here for a little while about Jesus as the, the head of the church, specifically the husband of the church. The church is the bride. Christ is the bridegroom. And this is where we're going to pick it up in Matthew chapter 25. You have your Bible open, say amen. amen. Matthew 25 verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. And so many things packed into this one passage of scripture here from, I guess we're reading from 1 to 13. Uh, but I want you to think about, in this context, I want you to think about two types of people in this world. Wise and foolish. And two types of people in this world who say they are waiting for Jesus. Okay, or who are in some way involved with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because what this story ultimately is about is the fact that some people who say they're following Jesus are going to miss what probably will amount to the single most important event in history, and that is the second coming. Okay, so then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps... And went forth to meet the bridegroom, and five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we move on. Heavenly Father, we pray, dear God, that you'd bless your word tonight. And Father, my, um, our hearts are, we are thinking about Sister Bernice. We thank you, Lord, for the many years that she sat in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for using her as uh, one of the pillars of our church. A woman of faith, a woman of great faith, a woman of reliance upon you. And now, Lord, even in the last, what may be the last breaths of her life, she still gives honor 
in the weakness of her flesh, she still gives honor to your word. And I pray, Lord, that you'd bless that in the remaining hours or days that she has on this earth. I pray, dear God, that you would give her comfort, uh, take away any pain that she might have. Pray that you'd bless her two children. And I pray, dear God, that through her life, through her death, through her uh, resurrection, Father, that they would come to know Jesus if they don't already. So, Father, we just ask God that you visit with her tonight and give all of her family comfort. We thank you, dear God, for those you've brought into this place tonight. We ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to your word, teach us some great and mighty things that we never knew, things that we knew that we need to be retrained on, things we need to remember. Help us to never forget the awesome things that we find in your word. Bless your people tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So verse 3. I got five wise, five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions tonight. What you think these symbols mean? Uh, what does the lamp represent? What do you think that oil represents? Uh, verse 4, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And how wise do you have to be to understand that a lamp doesn't work if it doesn't have fuel? I mean, we're not talking about rocket scientists or sending somebody to the moon or brain surgery. We're talking about something as simple as the lamp doesn't work if there's no oil in it. So it doesn't have to be too wise, but... You'd be surprised. I'm, I'm amazed at how foolish people are in this world. But anyway, at midnight, uh, excuse me, verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there came, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. We've looked at the story of Adam and Eve, how God brought the, the bride to Adam. Uh, we do that when we have a wedding uh, the, the father will bring the daughter, his daughter down and then give his daughter to the man to be married. And the symbolism goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three or yeah, Genesis chapter two, where God created woman and brought the woman to the man. That's where that comes from. The fact that and just think about how much of civilization around the world throughout history is based upon biblical concepts. The fact that the woman takes the name of the husband and not the other way around. That also comes from Genesis. It comes from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 5, God called their name Adam. Eve was called after the name of her husband, not the other way around. And that tradition exists. I don't know if there's places where it doesn't exist, but that tradition has existed for thousands of years all over the world. And so there's just a lot of... What, how we see marriage and what marriage is. I had the misfortune today of witnessing the dissolution of a sodomite marriage. Two women divorcing one another. Now I'm going to throw this in as a, as a political statement. I don't care if you get upset, but here it is. When the sodomite agenda pushed to get marriage in favor of them, so they, it was never about their honoring marriage. It was never about that. It was all about destroying what marriage actually represents. Can I get an amen out of somebody? That's what it was all about. Now, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be... Uh, hateful in any way but God created this world and God gave us ways to live and and I will say this of myself before I say it about anybody else 
in the ways that I have gone against God in my life, I have absolutely suffered the consequences for it. Absolutely. I'll put myself at the top of the list as a warning to anybody who will listen, as a warning to anybody who thinks that they can change God or change how God put things in place here in this world to anybody who thinks they can change that and there not be consequences, I'm telling you there are always consequences. And I'm praying about uh, preaching that Sunday about just if we were to add up exactly what sin actually costs us. Do we not understand there is always a price for sin? Always. And you can say, well, Jesus paid the price. Uh, you add it up. It cost each one of us. Not, not, I'm not talking about cost you what somebody else did, cost you what you did. Amen? Uh, but anyway, marriage. Uh, back to the scriptures. Verse 4. The wives took their oil and their vessel with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Uh, somebody give me a, an example somewhere in the Bible of another place where a door was shut. Noah's Ark. And at, at what point did Noah, Courtney, I'm going to throw you a curve. What, when did, what day did Noah shut the door of the ark? She ain't dumb. Don't let that freckle-faced red hair fool you. She said, Noah didn't. God did. Jesus said, I am he that shutteth and no man openeth, and he that openeth and no man shutteth. Okay? And I guarantee you there's a jar of mayonnaise in your refrigerator that Jesus shut, and there's no way in the world you're going to get it open. I'm telling you that right now. Okay? But he shuts and no man opens. And, you know, I, I've read and heard all my life about how the rapture is going to happen, and when it does, there's going to be people who are left behind, and when you're left behind, you'll get another chance to be saved. I don't think you ought to plan on that. I don't think you ought to lay money down or your soul on that happening. Now, it might happen. I mean, I, God's a merciful God. But if you're waiting to skip the first opportunity in hopes that there will be a second one when you don't know for sure that there will be a second one, you're a fool. Amen? And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with foolish people and wise people. The wise virgins were ready. They had a lamp, and they said it's stupid to have a lamp but not have oil in it, so we're going to keep oil in it. We're going to do that. We're going to make sure that there's oil in this lamp and it's going to stay that way and nothing is ever going to not, there's never going to be a day when there's not going to be oil in this lamp. We're going to make sure. And that's exactly how this thing went down. It was the foolish people. Now I'm going to break some of this down in a minute. Verse, so verse 11, after the door was shut and afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, Open to us. There's a place in the scriptures where they said, Lord, Lord. Jesus said, not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody. Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So let me just throw this out to you. Number one, what do you think this lamp represents? And, and there can be more than one answer. The Holy Spirit is a lamp. The, the lamp in the tabernacle had seven candlesticks in it. And those seven candlesticks were the seven spirits of God. That's from Revelation 4. So it does represent the Holy Spirit. 
And, I mean, and, and break that down then. You've got ten women, virgins, who say they're following Christ. Five of them are full of the Holy Spirit, and five of them are not. And if you're not, that means you're not born again. You're not saved. You're not... Jesus didn't say, I knew you, but then I forgot you, or I knew you and I threw you out. He said, I know you not. Um, I think he says later on, Matthew 20, depart from me, for I never knew you. So they're foolish because they follow Christ, or they say they follow Christ, but they are not They've not been regenerated. They do not have the light of God in dwelling in them, living in them. They don't have the oil of the Holy Spirit. That's the other one, the oil. So the lamp is the Holy Spirit or the lamp is what else? The Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So you say, I have a Bible. Did you read it? No. Then what good does it do to have a Bible looks nice on the coffee table looks nice out here on the in the foyer of the church we got a nice Bible out there what good would it do if we had Bibles in it decorating every piece of furniture in this building but none of us read it none of us believed it what good would it do believe it or not that's what churches are turning into places that don't believe the Bible they they're using it sort of as this is who we are, but it's not really who they are. The Israelites uh, had the Philistines after them, and so they went and got the Ark of the Covenant, and they were going to parade the Ark of the Covenant in front of the Philistines. This is 1 Samuel 3 or 4. 1 Samuel 4, and they, they said, Fetch the Ark of the Covenant, for it will save us. It was a gold box, is what it was. They had a pot of manna in it, and it had the... The, the word of the law that Moses wrote in it had Aaron's rod that budded. So it had things in this world in it, but they said it will save us. And they were using their religion as a salvation mechanism instead of God. And that's what people do. They don't care what religion it is. I don't care what faith, denomination, what they call it, how long you believed it, how long it's been in your family. It does not matter if you do not believe God's word that's not, if, if you don't believe God's word, it's not salvation. You're foolish if you carry a lamp around that's never lit. Foolish if you do. It's like, you remember Andy Griffith, right? The TV show, Andy Griffith. Barney Fife had a pistol. But what, Brother George, was wrong with Barney Fife's pistol? He didn't have a bullet in it. He carried the bullet in his shirt pocket. So he's got a pistol. What good, Cubby, does a pistol do if there are no bullets in it? Zero. Okay? And that's the same idea. It's foolish to have a Bible and not read it. Foolish to have a Bible, not believe it. Foolish to say we're a Bible church, but we're not really a Bible church. All of these things are foolish. And basically what we're looking at is that not everyone who says I'm a church member, not everyone who says I'm a Christian, not everyone who says I'm of this denomination or this is my family's always been Baptist or my family's always been Catholic or we have our church membership at so and so church. And it's 400 miles away. And I know people like that. Okay. There have been people who have sent tithes to a church that they never attend and are never going to attend. And they, I guess it makes them feel good that they have their membership in a particular church. But that in itself, sending your tithes to a church and having your membership in a church is not salvation. I would not count on that. Amen? You want to be saved? If you want to go in before the door is shut, you want to go in before the door is shut, ask the bridegroom. Amen? And get some, get some oil in your lamp. And I'm going to throw this in as well. This 
there's a lot embedded in this teaching. And one area specifically has to do with um, the needs of a group versus an individual. Let me explain that. Communism, communalism, communitarianism, socialism, or any kind of any kind of, of idea, philosophy, government, religion that says if John got $500 for working, then it's not fair that John got money and nobody else in his community got money. So everybody should share in that. Everybody should get that. The hippies tried communal living. In various places back in the 60s. I watched a documentary on this done by PBS. And they were, they, they, they were very proud of themselves. Yeah, we tried it. And you've got, they'd say we had, we'd have 100 people living in a community. And the idea was that we would all go out and work or we would grow vegetables and we would sell things in town or whatever. And when we came in, we would bring all the money or all the food into one place and we would all share it. And we all had all things common, including each other's wives and husbands. They would share everything. So it started out working really well for a couple weeks. So then a guy who sits around playing the guitar all day long doesn't get up and work while everybody else goes out and works and brings food and money in. So he gets to enjoy the benefits of the community without actually doing anything for the community. When somebody else sees him sitting around playing the guitar, smoking marijuana, not doing anything, somebody else decides that they're not going to do anything. They're going to sit around and smoke marijuana and make love. And they're going to enjoy the benefits of the community without providing for the community. And then another one. And one guy wants to share another man's wife, but he gets ticked off because there's a, a man wanting to share his wife. And pretty soon, they all break out in a big war. And it collapses in on itself because now nobody's going out, bringing food in, bringing money in. Nobody's doing it. It doesn't work. It's never worked and it never will work. Okay. Now, I'm going to apply this to Christianity. The Bible says, and it says it very plainly, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. When you stand before God in judgment, God will not let you use the defense, it's everybody else's fault but mine. You will not be able to blame your parents, you'll not be able to blame your grandparents, you'll not be able to blame your children, your grandchildren, you'll not be able to blame the church you went to, the church you didn't go to, or the country you grew up in. You will not be able to blame anybody except you. And... I even read, uh, I can't remember one of the mainline denominations. I don't remember if this is the, the Presbyterian Church or the Episcopalian Church or one of them. They had, a, they had a liberal president and this president was a communitarianist. And she said, it's not fair if one person is saved and the rest of everybody else dies and is judged by God. We, none of us can be saved unless all of us are saved. Does God see it that way? Absolutely not. He does not see it that way. And one of your examples is right here. When the wise had oil for whose lamps? Their own lamp. When Jesus taught us to pray, how did he teach us to pray? Give us this day enough food for everybody. Give us this day our daily bread. One day... One person, enough bread for me for one day. And then tomorrow, do it again. So in this example, the foolish are the ones who have done nothing, accomplished nothing, required of themselves nothing, but require of everybody else that everybody else do something for them. And, you know, I know the Bible says give, 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 give. But in this case here, these people would have been giving away their own salvation. 
Now, I love people. And I am spending my life giving out as much of myself as I possibly can in one lifetime. I don't want people to have to die and go to the lake of fire for all of eternity. But I'm not going to give up my own salvation just for you. And I love you. But there's no requirement on me to spend eternity in hell for you, there's no requirement of that. Okay? So, you, you, your own self, alone, are and always will be responsible for reading your Bible, believing your Bible, trusting your Bible, asking God to help you through life, asking God for this, asking God for that. It is you and your, it is your salvation to gain or to lose. And if it's not anybody else's fault. Amen? All right. Romans, uh, you know what? Let's do this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Turn there very quickly. Uh, I want to get into the aspect of Jesus being um, the Son of God. I thought about this. And um, I thought, you know, I haven't taught on that. Jesus, Jesus is God, yes. Um, he, is, he has the attributes of God the Father, and we learn those attributes. Who remembers, by the way, the attributes of God, what we talked about? Who can remember all of them? Go ahead. I have no idea what she said. I can't hear her. But I think she said something like omniscient. That was one of them, right? Omnipresent. Omnipotent. Okay. Everlasting. I don't remember on me. So I'm not going to pin it on you. All right. Yeah. But anyway, all the attributes of God the Father are equally applied to God the Son. Okay. God is eternal. His Son is eternal. God is uh, all-powerful. Christ is all-powerful. In fact, Jesus said, all power has been given me in heaven and earth. So, and there's a verse for each one of those. So we're concentrating on exactly who Christ is and what makes him unique and separate from the Father. And one of the things I thought of, I, I had not put it in my notes anywhere. It was, he is the Son of God. And I'm going, that's, I think, the most important one. But anyway, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. One of the things we learn about God, as, and I can remember one of the things, even as a little boy, Sister Linda, in this church, that I don't, I don't remember who taught it to me, but I can remember specifically a Sunday school teacher teaching me about God being a jealous God. Okay, might have been Diane Nauman or somebody, but it was somebody who taught me in this church that God was a jealous God and you could not worship other gods and worship God at the same time. He's not going to have that. God is a jealous, jealous husband. And right fully so no other husband has bought and redeemed you the way christ has amen okay you spend that much money on a bride and that much of your own blood then she's going to be yours and not going to be long to anybody else so that's what paul's saying here i'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy i've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin in Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And if we keep on reading, he says, For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. So to say that Jesus, and I want you to think about it in religious terms. In in Buddhism, is there an anti-Buddha? Is there a fake Buddha? And if you look in 
um, Asian countries, Thailand or China, Japan, India, the places there in Asia where they worship Buddha, they all have a different, he looks different. You have the fat Buddha, you have the laughing Buddha, you have the skinny Buddha, you have the Buddha with the long ears. And there's all these different Buddhas, but they all say it's the same Buddha. So I don't think in Buddhism that there is a counterfeit Buddha where one would say, you're worshiping the wrong, you're worshiping the wrong idol. I, I don't know that there's anything like that. Same way in, in Islam. I don't think there is a counterfeit Muhammad the prophet. A counterfeit Allah. I don't think uh, whatever religions are out there, I think Christianity is fairly unique in that we believe that there is one God that we should worship. And we also believe that the tempter has a counterfeit for people to worship that is not the one true God that we're supposed to worship. Does that make sense to everybody? Another Jesus, Satan says in Ezekiel 28, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Second Thessalonians 2, so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Isaiah 14, Lucifer says, I will be like the Most High. He does not say, I will be like Buddha, I will be like Mohammed, I will be like what, uh, whatever. He says, I will be like the Most High. People will worship Satan himself, but believe that they're worshiping God. So we know there's a lie going to be told. And do you feel that it is important that you know who the real Jesus Amen. is? I do, especially if there's a counterfeit out there. The Secret Service, the United States of America, one of the divisions that it maintains is they have authority over counterfeit bills, counterfeit money. And a lot of investment and time goes into making the money and the currency that we use and there are always, there's always somebody who thinks they can match it pretty close and have a money machine that just prints out all the money they want. So it's a danger. It's a serious threat to just allow people all over the country to print out all their own money that's not real money. It's dangerous to our, to our society. It's dangerous to our economy. Something like that could throw us into a pretty bad situation. And it's the same with Jesus. If you say you worship, just like these wise virgins, if you say you worship and follow Jesus, but you don't believe the Bible, you don't read the Bible, you don't give heed to the Bible, then anybody can tell you anything about a different Jesus and you'll believe it because you don't know the real one from the fake one. Um, so anyway, where was I going after that? Anyway, that's what he was saying. A, a godly jealousy because there is a different other Jesus out there. John calls him, John, in fact, John is the only one who uses this term, antichrist. Anti is the opposite, a replacement for, or however you want to look at it. But it's not the real Jesus. It's not the real son of God. Now. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Let's look at Jesus then as being the Son of God. If I were to say to you that Islam and Christianity have the same God, you don't believe that, do you? Okay? So what, what is, how then, John, since you open your mouth up, how would you differentiate your God from the Islamic God, Allah? How would you, if somebody said, John, we all worship the same God, just different, have different religions, different names, but he's the same God. How would you then differentiate your God from who Allah is?
salvation. Okay. Here's where I'm going with this. And this is something that both Christians and Muslims absolutely agree on. Muslims absolutely say that Allah has no son. Okay? That's where I was getting at. When somebody said, John, John, they all worship the same God. I mean, you're going to that church and that's all good for you. But what about all these millions of Muslim people? Are you saying they're all going to hell because they're following God? Isn't it the same God? And it's a very simple... So here's, here's what Christians and Muslims agree on. Their God doesn't have a son. Our God does. And to us, that son is our religion. That's our savior. That's, that's everything. And this is what I was saying a while ago. The, the son of God permeates literally every square inch of your Bible. There's nothing in here that's not about Jesus. Yeah, they, okay, I didn't know that. You're saying Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? They would say then he's a special prophet. And, and okay, here's what I do know. That Muslims believe that their, their 12th imam is going to rise up out of a well and he's going to whistle down Jesus out of heaven. And Jesus is going to come down and say, you guys should have been Muslims. You all should have been Muslims. Everybody, go kill the Jews for me. Okay? Because that's essentially what they believe. They believe in Jesus. Or as Rick Warren said, Isa. They believe in a Jesus, but he's not God's son. He's just a good prophet who's going to tell everybody you should have been Muslim and kill the Jews. Okay, so if he's not the son of God, then he's not, I'll say it like this, if he's not the son of God, he's not God. Okay, the son of God is God. The son of man is a man. Okay, likewise, the son of God is God. God. So he absolutely is the only begotten Son of God. We might explore that. Daniel 3.25. This is, this is one of the, in fact, this is the only time the expression Son of God shows up anywhere in the Old Testament. The only place. Daniel 3.25. This is uh, the the four, uh, the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, their Hebrew names were Hananiah, um, Mishael, and Azariah. Nebuchadnezzar gave them new Babylonian names, so that's how they're identified. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, bow to my image when I play the music. They refused. They stood. When everybody else fell, there's a falling away there. And their punishment, and again... People, listen to, listen to me. Everybody listen. Serving God brings punishment. Do not be amazed at your struggles, at your defeats, at how hard things are. I'm preaching this to me. I'm telling me this. Do not be amazed when people hate you, despise you, turn against you. Do not be amazed when you get beat up, when you get persecuted, when you have trials, tribulations, troubles. Do not be amazed when you say, I stand for God, and they turn around and kill you for it. That's our calling. That's the real Christianity that will not sell Joel Osteen's books for him. Okay? So those, and they said, we believe that our God will save us from your fiery furnace. But if not, we are still not going to bow down to that. You can't make us. We're not going to do it. Burn us if you want to. I would have went gulp. Okay, what did I just say? But they believed God was going to save them. 
So they stood. So they're in the fiery furnace. You know the story. Nebuchadnezzar looks in there. In verse 25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. King James Bible is the only one that says it like that. All of the others say a son of the gods or one of the gods. They destroy, and I'm telling you, it is the only place in the whole Old Testament where it uses the phrase son of God. You're not going to find it anywhere else in the Old Testament. It's in one place, Daniel 3.25. Son of God. Now, I was told by a college student several years ago that Nebuchadnezzar, being a worshiper of multiple gods, said he was a son of the gods because that's all he understood. My response to him back was, here's what you're telling me. You're telling me that upon seeing the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you, it's impossible to know who he is. I guarantee you Nebuchadnezzar knew who that was in there. That he was the, the son of God. Nebuchadnezzar proclaimed he was the son of God. Mark, Mark's gospel, the very first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And notice that it's not a son of God. The son of God. John 1, 34, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. God himself declared it. 2 Peter 1, 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So he's declared in the Old Testament to be the Son of God. He's declared in the Gospels to be the Son of God. He's declared by God himself. If you believe what Peter said, I do. He heard God's voice coming down from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. This is him. Um, John chapter 20. You turn there. I'm going to read a couple more verses and we'll go to prayer. But John chapter 20, very last chapter of the book of John, says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written for one reason, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, why, is, why does he say the Christ? Because Matthew 24 prophesies there's going to come a time when many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And shall deceive many. That he is, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. And so I'm going to, I just answer the question, but I'm going to ask you the question. Is it even important that you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God if you want to have eternal life? Absolutely. You got to, you got to be right on that one. You got to believe that one. Okay. Now, you can disbelieve Adam had a belly button. Who cares? Nobody knows if Adam had a belly button. Nobody, I don't care. Okay? He didn't, didn't have clothes to have lint in his belly button for a while. Okay? But you can believe or disbelieve that all you want to. But when it comes to Jesus being the Son of God, you got to believe that one. Okay? And he said that these are written. Think about what Jesus did, what he's talking about. Raising John, John was the one who wrote the story of Lazarus in John 11. And John is saying, see that story there? That was written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Because who else can raise a man who's been four days dead? Who else can raise that man from the dead? Who else can do that? Nobody can. Now, I'm going to throw this in. Um, yeah. Uh, Matthew 26, Matthew 27, Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ, the son of God. It was questioned if thou be, Satan questioned it in Matthew 4, if, you be, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. Who remembers the song back in the 80s? We are the world, we are the children. Remember that song? USA for Africa, right? Remember the stink about that song? Willie Nelson sang his part 
It was written by Quincy Jones, and the part that Willie Nelson sang is, as God has shown us, by turning stones to bread. There's not a place in my Bible where God turns stones to bread. There's one place where Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones to bread. But that was written into that song, and we're going, oh, did you hear that? There's a conspiracy in music. Yeah, imagine that. They were trying to rewrite scripture by saying Jesus turned stones to bread. But that was just the temptation to. Satan made these demands. If thou be the son of God, then do that. If thou be the son of God, then do this. Well, John said, well, devil, he raised Lazarus from the dead. If you want this little piddly thing of turning stones to bread, go ahead. Let me read this and I'm going to let you go. Um, yeah. Mark 3, 11, the unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Luke 4, 41, the devils came also out of many, crying out, saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Luke 1, 35, the angel answered and said unto their Holy Ghost shall have come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Even the devils, lower devils than Satan. Satan's going, if you're the Son of God, he knew it. But these lower devils, they knew who he was. How did they know? They knew from eternity past. However old those devils were, they knew who their commander was. They knew who the king of kings and the lord of lords was. They have, if you, Job chapter 1 and 2, you have the congregation of the angels, the sons of God, gathering together to be with God. And I guarantee you, Jesus is standing right there and every devil in the universe knows that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen.